Hey everybody, I'm Silas, and welcome to Silas Cybology. Let's expand our mind. This is a series where we talk about the research on psilocybin, the psychedelic prodrug found in magic mushrooms. We'll be breaking down and discussing the scientific literature, one study at a time, from past to present. Before getting into today's episode, I wanted to say thank you to Viz Journalist for leaving my first iTunes review. I really appreciate it, and leaving ratings and reviews really helps promote the show. As for your comment, I definitely understand the frustration caused by hearing different pronunciations. I remember I had a teacher once pronounce the opioid methadone as methadone, and it drove me a bit mad. <laughs> I think the reason that I pronounce it psilocybin instead of psilocybin is because I may have been really introduced to the word for the first time, at least out loud, when I was living in the UK. After a tiny bit of investigative work, and by that I mean going on the online Oxford Dictionary and comparing it to Dictionary.com, it appears like the way I pronounce it might be a common British pronunciation. I also looked up some videos of Dr. Carhart Harris, a psychedelic researcher at Imperial College London, who we will be talking about extensively when we get into the research in the 2000s, and he seems to pronounce it in a similar way as well. My alternative explanation is that I first heard the word psilosis before psilocybin. Psilosis, in a medical context, means the falling out of hair. Circling back to your comment, though, although I may try to intentionally vary my pronunciation a bit here and there, hopefully when I pronounce it differently, it doesn't distract too much from the rest of the content. Again, thank you so much for leaving the review. Oh, and as an aside, I also found a hilarious thread on shroomery, full of very unique pronunciations. I had a great time reading through them, so the link to that will be in the episode transcript for anyone who might enjoy it. Moving on to today's episode, the article we'll be discussing is titled Comparison of Psilocin with Psilocybin, Mescaline, and LSD-25, published in 1962. Like I did back in episode 8, I want to quickly mention that this is yet another incredibly unethical study conducted by Harris Isbell involving the coerced experimentation on black Americans who were imprisoned under U.S. narcotic laws. If you want to hear more about this, check out episode one, where I talk about it in a bit more detail. The objective of this study was to see if psilocin produced similar effects as psilocybin, mescaline, and LSD. The researchers also aimed to calculate the relative potencies of these drugs. Potency is simply a measure of how much of a given drug is needed to produce a given effect. This latter aim is really the primary focus, so I do apologize if from the title you are expecting a much more detailed account comparing the subjective effects of these drugs. Hopefully we'll come across that in a future episode. As we talked about extensively last episode, psilocybin gets dephosphorylated into psilocin, which is why at the start of each episode I refer to psilocybin as a prodrug, because it gets metabolized after administration into a different psychoactive drug. In the 1960s, however, there was still some uncertainty as to whether or not the administration of psilocin in humans produces the same effects that are seen after the administration of psilocybin. Now in this paper, two different experiments are referenced. It sounds like, from how they are described, there was one experiment involving 10 subjects who were given LSD, mescaline, and psilocybin in a randomized order, and a second experiment involving five different subjects who were given psilocin and psilocybin in a randomized order. According to the researchers, the aim of the first experiment was actually to determine the cross-tolerance between LSD and mescaline, and the objective measures taken from the first experiment are largely reported separately in a different paper. However, data from the experiment is discussed here when attempting to determine relative potencies between the drugs, and in comparing subjective experiences. One thing I wanted to note about how these drugs were administered is that unlike dissolving the drugs in a solution, often of cherry syrup, for oral administration, all of these drugs were administered intramuscularly, meaning that they were injected into muscle tissue. This tends to make the effects of a drug come on more rapidly and can influence the bioavailability of the drug, or how much of the drug is circulated throughout the body. The other thing I wanted to note is that in preparing psilocin for injection, the researchers noted that they included vitamin C in the solution because it prevented it from turning a dark blue color. As we also mentioned in the last episode, one of the pathways that psilocin can be degraded results in a dark blue color. So far, we've already seen that including potassium cyanide inhibits this particular route of degradation, and it looks like we might be able to add vitamin C to that list as well. 
So the results section of the study is very short. There's, in essence, one sentence discussing the objective measures they recorded, one sentence comparing the subjective measures, and then two short paragraphs discussing the relative potencies of the drugs examined. Unsurprisingly, the researchers found that psilocin, psilocybin, LSD, and mescaline all produced increases in body temperature, blood pressure, pupillary diameter, and a decreased threshold for the knee-jerk reflex. They also reported that, subjectively, they all caused anxiety, elation, euphoria, difficulty concentrating, and marked alterations in sensory perceptions. At a really high level, they all essentially acted as you would expect a psychedelic drug to act. And that's about as much detail as the researchers go into in this study. They did note, however, that some participants occasionally failed to realize that the effects they experienced were due to the drug, which is something that largely has not been the case in the prior studies we've come across. The researchers did not, however, note under which drugs that loss of insight was seen, or for what symptoms it applied to. The more substantial data the researchers report on in this paper are the relative potencies between the drugs. They don't unfortunately go into great detail as to how precisely they made these calculations, but they do say that they base them off of the peak pupillary response to each drug. As we know, these drugs all increase pupil diameter, and pupil diameter can actually be used to illustrate the time course of a drug with surprising accuracy, as we saw in episode 1. That said, I'm definitely not convinced it's the best measure for determining potency, and we'll see why in a second. Starting with comparing psilocin to psilocybin, the researchers found that based on their calculations, psilocin is approximately 1.48 times as potent as psilocybin. This would mean hypothetically if you normally take, let's say, 30 milligrams of psilocybin, then you would only need to take roughly 20 milligrams of psilocin to get the same effect. Now what's interesting is that this is actually really close to the ratio for the molecular weight of the two drugs, which is 1.4. Of the three relative potencies discussed in this paper, this one is by far the one I'd give the most credence to. Moving on to the next comparison, the researchers calculated that psilocin is 66 times as potent as mescaline. To provide some context, and something to compare that to, let's just quickly take a look at what the Psychonaut wiki page lists as threshold and heavy doses of these drugs. And I'll give the disclaimer, this is just to give us a comparison based on what some people who use these drugs have reported as being threshold and heavy doses, so take them with a grain of salt. While a threshold and heavy dose of psilocin is reported to be 5 and 40 milligrams, respectively, a threshold and heavy dose of mescaline is 50 and 800 milligrams, respectively. While clearly the trend is the same, such that psilocin is in fact more potent than mescaline, based on these numbers, psilocin is only about 10 to 20 times as potent as mescaline, rather than 66 times as potent. Finally, examining psilocin and LSD, the researchers calculated that LSD is 45 times as potent as psilocin. Making the same comparison using the dose ranges for psilocin and LSD from the Psychonaut wiki page, a threshold and heavy dose of LSD is about 0.015 and 0.3 milligrams, indicating that it's roughly 130 to 330 times as potent as psilocin. The trends are again the same. But in this instance, it looks like the researchers may be underestimating just how much more potent LSD is compared to psilocin. Now I want to add that one reason for these discrepancies, in addition to very different methodologies used for calculating the ratios, is likely that this study, as I mentioned earlier, administered the drugs intramuscularly, which can have a significant influence on how the drug acts on the body. By comparison, the ranges that I just reported on were either oral or sublingual, meaning dissolved under the tongue. Well, that's it for today's brief episode. As always, I really hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions, feedback, or ideas for the show, please let me know. You can find out all the ways to reach me on the website, psilocybology.org, where you can also find the full transcript for each episode if interested. Thank you all for listening, and I'll talk to you next time.